one to pay attention to. And we're really grateful for the work that Steve McQuitty has done to, to bring attention to all of the conscientious objectors during World War II, but particularly the fascinating camp at Waldport that started the Fine Arts Group. And that's a history that's featured in our exhibit. We encourage you to take a look at that, and obviously you're gonna learn about it a lot today as well. I also wanna recognize the, uh, the work of the Veterans for Peace Group. There are several folks here from Veterans for Peace. We're really glad to have you here. If folks from Veterans for Peace wanna wave their hands in case folks wanna ask you about upcoming things, <laughs> And in particular, I want to give recognition to our really special guest here today, Will Poole. Uh, Mr. Poole is a World War II veteran who's active with the Veterans for Peace. Uh, Mr. Poole, if you want to wave your hand while I'm talking about you, he's over there. <laughs> Will Poole was born in Port Angeles, Washington. He is a 100% product of the Pacific Northwest. He served in World War II as a naval air crewman. He then went to school on the GI Bill and earned a BA in social science, a master's in education in public school administration, and an MA in Russian studies. He worked as a teacher and also in heavy construction work, among other jobs, and he was influenced by the Quakers as a young man. So, let me introduce today's speaker, and then we'll have some opportunity for Q&A and other speaking afterward. Uh, Mr. Steve McQuitty writes and lectures on the eccentric margins of our history and culture. He has won awards for his feature writing from the Society of Professional Journalists, and he has written for Salon, Mother Jones, and the Seattle Times. His monograph, The Fantastic Tale of Opal Whiteley, has been widely cited and reprinted, and he was a featured commentator on the topic for Oregon Public Broadcasting. He is an honorary director of the Oregon Cultural Heritage Commission, and he currently teaches writing at Lane Community College. And I just want to take a second and say how much I admire the work that he's done on the book here on the edge, which he's going to talk about today. I have a little bit of familiarity with some of the resources that he used. And I've said this before, but I just want to recognize again that I know the amount of work that it took to piece together from all kinds of collections all over the country and people's memories what it took to actually be able to bring together the full story of the fine arts at Walport is a tremendous amount of research and dedication. And I'm very grateful to Steve McQuitty for taking the time to do that and for doing it so incredibly well. So please join me in welcoming Steve McQuitty. This isn't just a mutual admiration society. I mean this sincerely. Um, Eliza knows what she's talking about. Uh, she did significant research and oral history work. Can you hear okay? Is it on? How's that? Sorry. And she did significant research and oral history work. And uh, without the work Eliza and other people had done, there's no way this book could have ever happened. So let's get right down to it. I want to uh, <clears throat> tell you about another book, actually. We're going the right way? In 1934, a book came out titled Peace with Honor, and it was essentially an appeal to reason. Um, it was a renunciation of modern war, the kind of uh, industrial slaughter, if you will, that humans had developed with their machines. And the author said, we claim we want peace, but again and again we go to war. And he said, if we truly want peace, we must renounce not war, but the very idea of war. And this struck a chord, and the book went into multiple printings on both sides of the Atlantic, and within a year, a revised edition came out with a new preface by its author, A. A. Emil, the man who had given the world Winnie the Pooh. But then there was Adolf Hitler in Pearl Harbor. And then everyone was on board. Artists, actors, filmmakers, and some of the biggest names in literature. <clears throat> and even Mr. Milne joined the chorus. And in 1940, while the uh, Blitz was going on in London, he published a follow-up pamphlet called War with Honor. And I quote from him here. He said, if anybody reads Peace with Honor now, they must read it with that one word, Hitler, scrawled across every page. <clears throat> I want to take just a minute and um, depart a little and draw attention to the exhibit here. I'm assuming that a number of you have seen the exhibit, and if you haven't, I urge you to go multiple times. It is incredibly uh, um, complex and uh, dense in both its breadth 
and its, uh, and its death. And as Eliza mentioned, you will, there is a section that talks about um, uh, the uh, conscientious objectors and the people in the camp that I'll talk about here today. But um, I urge you to, you know, take a good look at this exhibit. If you haven't, if you already have, return there again. I've gone multiple times. And when I go back each time, I see a little more. I hear a little more. And uh, I also pulled out a few details about um, Portland that I decided to add here today. And this is uh, right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Here's a few things that happened. Guards were immediately doubled at airport and military posts. Soldiers were sent to waterfront docks, sheriff's deputies to the county courthouse, and policemen to the city's bridges. Three officers were stationed at the Japanese consul's home, and another officer was stationed at his office. And the Portland's mayor called civil defense leaders together, and he called a meeting. More than one, more than 100 people showed up, five times the number they had anticipated. And uh, one of the people there was a former World War I general and former governor of Oregon. His name was Charles Martin. And when he was told about the overflow crowd outside, I quote, he said, well, it's a good idea. Why in hell discourage it? 800 firefighters and 6,000 Red Cross workers were ready. The Teamsters Union, the Longshoremen and Warehousemen, and the International Woodworkers of America all pledged their support. And the Oregon Parents and Teachers Association said that their 25,000 members could be ready within 24 hours. Blackouts were called meaning all external lights turned off and windows covered completely. And the Oregonian reporter, quote, the lights of Broadway, far famed for their brilliance, were snuffed out as if by a giant hand. Businesses that hadn't shut off their neon signs were informed by crowds in the streets that if they didn't do so immediately, they would be helped with rocks. There was no hysteria, the Oregonian said. There was no demonstrations. But there was emotion, this is a direct quote. The, but there was emotion, a mounting anger, born of the conditions under which the United States had been attacked, a gnawing kind of anger, which found release in fervently expressed desire for full vengeance. And because this is, this is the Oregon Historical Society, I'm gonna mention the name Earl Pomeroy. Anybody recognize that name? Earl Pomeroy went on, a couple people, good. He went on to make a, quite a name for himself as an historian. Uh, he was a professor of history down at the University of Oregon. And he wrote this uh, as a reporter for the Oregonian at the beginning of his career, right after Pearl Harbor. Who knows what happened over on the coast right after Pearl Harbor? Well, there weren't enough military people, so the people took, their, uh, uh, took it into their own hands. So the locals uh, formed militia groups. And they formed from Florence to Tillamook Bay. They had names like the Sayusar Rifles and the Newport Guerrillas. And the Yaquita Bay News wrote, the spirit behind the guerrilla bands is typical of the spirit of the whole American people, still willing to fight hard for their liberties, just as their ancestors did in 1776. And this is a Newswire photo that I found online, actually. And the quote underneath uh, says, their agreeable expressions might quickly change for enemy invaders. They called them airships during World War II, and they floated up and down the coastline, um, watching for um, uh, possible enemy invasion and uh, engaged in search and rescue missions. Local boats were refitted for military duty, and men who were too old or un oops, there we go. Men who were too old or unqualified for the military, they wanted to show their support. And so the local militia units patrolled the coastline and stood watch at lookout points. Some traveled with attack dogs. You did not want to be on the beach after the blackout hours. Well, not everyone wanted to support the war. In fact, there were some people who didn't want to support any war, anywhere. But what could they say? What could they do? It was Glenn Caulfield. He registered as a conscientious objector, and he was assigned to a work camp, but he refused to accept government subsidy for his bus fare from his home in Missouri to Arkansas, so he walked the 300 miles from his home to his camp. Remember this photo, I'll be coming back to it. Bill Everson. 
He declared himself a pantheist, and he said America should pull out of the war immediately. So, quote, where is it? Okay. So he would. He said, so men of the future would say, here was finally a people in all the bloody past who loved peace too much to fight for it. Kermit Sheets said he'd been raised on the Bible, and it said simply, thou shalt not kill. Madge Langley. She grew up here in Portland in the 1920s, and when she saw soldiers returning from World War I, they were damaged physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. She swore that she could never support a war. So when World War II came, rather than go to work for the military, she went to work for the conscientious objector camps. There were many, many more. Adrian Wilson, he was a printer of fine books who went on to win one of the, one of the earliest MacArthur Genius Grants. It was Clayton James. He became an internationally renowned sculptor, and he made his home up in the Puget Sound country as uh, one of the uh, a group that was called the Pacific Northwest Mystic Painters. And Clayton is actually still alive, living up there uh, to this day. He's, uh, I think, 97 years old. He's living in the same house that he's lived in since the early 50s. Kemper Nomlin was an award-winning architect in Southern California, and among other things, he designed homes of Hollywood stars. Vladimir Dupre, who was friends in New York with the civil rights leader Bayard Rustin, and also the legendary Billy Holiday when he was 19 years old. And Vlad is 95 now, he's become a very good friend of mine, he lives down in Davis, California, and he told me the stories of how he'd be there at 19 years old in New York, right, hanging out at a bar in Harlem, right, with Baird at the table, and Billy would go up and sing, and then she'd come and sit down and hang out with him. So he was feeling pretty special about that. Well, uh, there's too many people to name them all here. What they have in common is a camp. It's Civilian Public Service Camp Number 56, also known as Camp Angel, just south of Walport on the Central Oregon coast. It was one of 150 work camps set up across the country between 1941 and 1946. And this is where conscientious objectors would do work in lieu of military service. The point was to provide the COs some kind of productive work, rather than just throwing them into prison or worse, as had been done in World War II and earlier. And so this is part of the Selective Training and Service Act passed by Congress and signed by President Roosevelt in 1940, the very first peacetime draft. And so part of this was to create a, uh, an organization called Civilian Public Service, also known as CPS. And this is um, where the CEOs could do work of what they call, quote, national importance across the country. So there's roughly 50,000 conscientious objectors in World War II, and about half of these people were sent to non-combatant roles or otherwise excused. Out of that total, about 12,000 were actually in the CPS camps, and they would do work, usually in remote rural areas, and they do the type of work very similar to the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which I think many of us know was a very um, successful and popular uh, New Deal program in the 1930s. In fact, many of the CPS camps were already CCC camps, and they were ready and waiting for the conscientious objectors. CPS itself is incredible. It was an incredibly complex and successful public-private partnership. It worked like this. The camps and the equipment to do the work were provided by the U.S. government. Everything else, administration, room and board, funding, food, all of that was provided by private organizations. Anybody know who they were? The, yep, the three historic peace churches. They were known for their long-standing uh, opposition to war. The Friends or the Quakers, the Brethren, and the Mennonites. And literally, the members of these churches donated money to fund these camps. And many of the CEO's families did too as well. So they generally worked for eight and one half hour days, six days a week for no pay. Oh wait, they did get $2.50 a month. And that was usually spent on things like soap and razor blades and toothpaste. And their holidays, Sunday and Christmas day. Their conscription lasted for the duration. Nobody knew how long that was gonna be. So they had to stay in for the length of the war, plus six months. 
depending on a camp's location in the country, the work might be forestry, soil conservation, agriculture, dairy, fish and wildlife. They even had one camp on the, in the Northeast doing weather research. And Camp 56, in the heart of Oregon's logging country, naturally focused on tree planting. Yeah, you can see that okay, right? That doesn't look too bad, does it? It's kind of a nice day like today. Sun's out, not too bad. Go do some work and then, uh, you know, have dinner, relax. Here's what it looks like in the winter. And we're all Oregonians, so we know what it's like in the winter, right? And uh, so they spent their 